my mouth and the meditations of all our heart be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our Savior, our bread from heaven, and our Redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. I must admit that political scandal catches my attention every time. It's probably why journalists and authors write about it so often, because they know it uh, titillates us and interests us. If royalty is involved, even better, and history is full of scandal. Secrecy and cover-up often accompany scandal, thus doubling the wrongdoing. First comes the act that causes the scandal, whether political, moral, or legal, and then the lying to hide the scandalous act as to the scandal, making it many times worse for the participants when all is revealed. Eventually, all is revealed. Scandal does not stay hidden for long. In time, someone speaks out about it. As we hear today from 2 Samuel, even the Bible has recorded royal scandal for us to read all these many years after it happened. Scandal can be both shocking and distasteful, amusing and disturbing, disappointing and tragic, especially for those people caught up in it, and sometimes for their fellow citizens if it transforms into national scandal or an international incident. Scandal can turn us into judges, giving us a sense of superior thinking. We may think to ourselves, well, that would never happen to me. I would never get caught in corruption, lies and deceit. I'd know better than that. In this reading from the second book of Samuel, we hear about the aftermath of King David's impulsive affair with Bathsheba. It's the sex scandal of the ancient world. David lusted after Bathsheba, a married woman. That's bad enough, but she also happens to be married to one of his soldiers, an honorable man named Uriah, who was away fighting David's war. And it's interesting to note that David is not leading his army into battle. He is home in his palace while they are in the battlefield. David sends for Bathsheba, and there's a huge power imbalance between them since he is king, and we don't know if she went willingly or felt she had no choice but to go to the king's bed. After their tryst, she becomes pregnant. Well, this is bad for David and bad for Bathsheba. David contrives to get Uriah back from the front under the guise of David wanting a report from the battlefield. The king encourages him to go home to his wife and sleep with her. Therefore, when Bathsheba's pregnancy starts to show, everyone will assume the baby is Uriah's child. But Uriah won't share his wife's bed because the army is fighting the king's war. Uriah was a pious soldier consecrated for war. And it was customary that soldiers did not go home to their wives during war. Instead, they would stay in encampments with their fellow soldiers during war. Uriah is an honorable man, and he won't go to his home while his brother's soldiers are away fighting. So David asks his general to put Uriah in the front line of the fighting, and as expected, Uriah is killed in battle. Then David marries Bathsheba quickly after a suitable period of mourning, believing any scandal will be avoided because people will assume that David is the father of the baby. Adultery and now murder. This is really bad for David. David may have thought that he had completed the cover-up of his adultery and done enough to stop others from knowing that anything scandalous ever happened with Bathsheba. David shows a callous disregard for both Uriah and Bathsheba. They are pawns in his scandal drama. He didn't stop and think about the impact his actions would have on their marriage or on their lives. David acts in a thoughtless and entitled way. He acts with impunity. He seems to think he is beyond accountability. He is the king. However, David cannot hide his behavior from God. God sees all, and God sends the prophet Nathan to challenge David's thinking about the whole Bathsheba affair. Nathan handles this whole encounter in a way that sounds familiar to us. Like in Jesus' use of parables, Nathan tells David a story. He describes a scenario to David. Nathan leaves out names, he uses metaphor instead. There's a rich man with many assets, huge flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, and there is a poor man with just one asset, one female lamb. 
He raised it. She grew up with his children. He fed her from his plate. The lamb was like a daughter to him. It was precious and valuable to the poor man. Nathan says that one day a traveler visited the rich man. And although he had many sheep and cattle, he decided to take the poor man's lamb to feed his guest. It's a terrible story. The unfairness of it all makes us angry, even today. And it made David angry. He explodes with anger and tells Nathan that the rich man should be punished severely for the wrong he has done. He must repay the poor man for what he's taken from him. David condemns the rich man for having no pity for the poor man. He sees the sin, the wrongness of what the rich man has done. Therefore, his moral compass isn't completely broken. He just wasn't applying it to his own actions. I'm sure David's display of cognitive dissonance and hypocrisy makes Nathan want to explode. He tells him, you are the rich man. God has given you so much, wives, power, position, God's favor, yet you committed this evil against someone who was your loyal servant. David has abused his authority and made God unhappy. God had pulled David out of his poor shepherd existence and set him on a path of privilege to rule over the houses of Judah and Israel. God chose David to be king. God anointed David to be king. And David has disappointed God in a very serious way. Nathan goes on in detail about how God will react and tells him how David could lose everything. David must have eventually made the connections himself and the, between himself and the rich man and the scandal that he spent so much time in covering up. He takes that step back to dispassionately realize what he's done. He has not just damaged the lives of Uriah and Bathsheba, he has endangered his image as king. However, David does not double down and deny what Nathan has so carefully pointed out to him. David has taken on the lesson Nathan has so carefully presented to him, and he is sorry. He's reflected on the injustice of his actions, and he confesses to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David knows he has to do better to live into the trust God has placed in him. God gives him another chance to be worthy. God continues in God's gentleness to David. David is punished, but he does not die. We see David's challenges as his story unfolds in the scriptures. He and his family will have their share of troubles, but God sticks with David and does not abandon him. God does show mercy to David because God still loves him and God does not give up on David. The story of the scandal of David also reminds us of God's acts of forgiveness and mercy. God does forgive the repentant sinner because God loves us. God still has faith and believes in us. The powerful are not above the law. We are accountable for our actions. David takes in all of that new knowledge in his encounter with Nathan the prophet. Some theologians, particularly of the New Testament, speak about the scandal of the cross. God humbled God's self to become human and live one life in the person of Jesus. He did signs and wonders, healed the sick, fed the hungry, taught with wisdom and authority. He ushered in the kingdom of God. For all of his goodness, Jesus was arrested, suffered and was crucified because the religious and political authorities were offended and scandalized by him and his message. It is a scandal that they covered up their desire for power over the people by executing the man who told them God loved the people and wanted to set them free. The minions of the Roman Empire showed him no mercy. Jesus told them things they did not want to hear about, like loving others as we wish to be loved forgiving each other when we sin against one another, loving friends and enemies alike, reaching out to those who live on the margins of society. Jesus showed grace, not hatred, for those who hanged him on the cross, even though in our eyes they may have deserved it. Instead, Jesus said, they do not know what they are doing. But that is the definition of God's grace. It is something God does freely. It means we receive grace when we don't do anything to deserve it. Conversely, it means we don't get what we deserve for our sins. 
God instead reacts with love and forgiveness. God never stops loving us. God gives us so much love, we can never repay God for all God's love that comes our way. And that's what David discovered as well, that God's love and forgiveness are very real, and God restores the repentant heart. Amen.